I think especially right now, our world moves at such a fast pace that it's hard to stop and take the time to measure and take the time to pull people together to come up with solutions. And then you create that action plan and it gets buried beneath your email list. You know, it's hard to create the space to do this. So I would just say, you know, keep at it. It works. Probably the best way to gain traction is to just keep doing it mm -hmm. because it proves itself every time. Welcome to the Just In Time Cafe, GoLeanSixSigma.com's official podcast, where we help you build your problem-solving muscles. We share best practices from over 20 years of success, helping organizations from the Fortune 500 to small and medium-sized business to government achieve their goals using Lean Six Sigma. Hey, Elizabeth. Hello, Tracy. What is going on today? It's very busy in here. I think these are all students coming in here because school is back in session. I remember the days. Maybe we should go to the private dining room now. Um, I will meet you there. I'm going to grab a menu. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just In Time Cafe. I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and this is Elizabeth Swan is joining me. We are your hosts. Elizabeth, what is on the menu today? I'm glad you're asking. I'm going to give you a glimpse of today's menu. For today's appetizer, we've got an app that leans out podcasts. I like that concept because mm -hmm. we're running one. All right. In the news, we've got two great stories, uh, one in government and one in healthcare. On the government side, we've got the state of Washington and how they saved a million hours in wait times. I know. Right? That's just the beginning. I can't wait to tell you about that. Yeah, and now they're part of a Harvard study, so we're going to get back into that. And then the healthcare side, we're going to cover how a New York hospital system saved over a million dollars. So we've got this million thing going on, and they both use Lean Six Sigma. Healthcare system started in a dynamite factory. <laughs> so we have to get up to the bottom of that. <laughs> on the printed page, we'll cover a book that proves stress is actually good for you. It's great. And then today's Q&A covers a learner's question about how scorecards keep score. And today's special is an, your interview with Ashley Gambier at UC San Diego. And if you enjoy the podcast, please give us a review. Let us know. What do you like about it? What do you see that we can improve? We'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to tell others about this podcast, because if you enjoy it, we're hoping others will too. Sharing is caring. Let's get to the appetizer. Tell us about this app that leans out podcasts. Today's app is called Overcast, which sounds like a bad day, but this is a free app for iPhones, iPads, and Apple Watches. And leaning out podcasts means the app treats silences as the waste of waiting. Like you're waiting for the next word, right? So not only streamlines the dialogue, but it also speeds up the conversation which was a little concerning when I read the initial description of it, but nobody sounds like they just inhaled helium or something like that. It's kind of imperceptible, but the podcasts are quicker. They take less time. It also boosts and normalizes the volume. So if you've got quieter people, neither one of us qualifies as a quiet pe person, but if there's somebody who's quieter on the podcast, th you're going to get a, their volume boost, but it won't make the loud people louder. So it just makes it easier to hear. It makes voices crisper, more distinct. And you just load your podcast into Overcast, and it's pretty intuitive. We both tried it, so I'm interested in your your thoughts about it. But I've been using it, and the voices are definitely crisper. The podcasts play faster. Uh, you could try it with your next Just In Time Cafe podcast. I don't see Tracy and I leaving much room for silence, but what there is, it will pull out. And I want to give a shout out to Barry in Jamestown, Rhode Island for the recommendation on this app. So Tracy, what'd you think about it? I really liked it. It was very easy to use. I really like the smart speed feature because over time, if you are a big podcaster, you're going to save literally hundreds of hours with eliminating pauses that just waste your time anyways, as you suggest, Elizabeth. I also like the idea of voice boost where it will, again, compensate the quiet and overly loud. I wish my TV had that. I am constantly <laughs> reducing the volume on my TV because it doesn't have voice boost. I really wish they would make that as a feature as well. Or I need to buy a new TV. 
Um, <laughs> but it also helps you listen to more shows, try new things. It gives you smarter playlists. It has a four and a half star rating on iTunes, which is great. So I'd recommend it to all podcast listeners, our listeners as well. And it's free. You're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. I'm Elizabeth Swan. Next up, it's in the news. So, Elizabeth, before we get into the news, tell us a little bit about this webinar that we've got. This month's webinar is how to collect data, how to successfully collect data for your Lean Six Sigma project. And this is a real nuts and bolts, taking through data collection planning, how to create check sheets, what are the best ways to involve people in your data collection. So really great, introductory, good for all levels. Download it. Join us every month for our webinars. Wonderful. So, Elizabeth, tell me. Why did Lean Hospital Leaders start in a dynamite factory? <laughs> I'm still a little baffled about this one, but I know that's where they got their lean training. So this story comes from reporter Leah Pickett. She's with uh, Quality Magazine, and she covered a organization, a, a teaching healthcare system in Schenectady, New York, called Ellis, and this is... Uh, the second news item in two months about Lean Six Sigma upstate New York hospitals. So something's going on upstate in New York. This is a sizable organization. They have four campuses. They have 3,300 employees, 700 medical staff. They provide inpatient and outpatient care. And Kristen May is the director there of organizational performance and innovation. And she contracted with the Greater Boston Manufacturing Partnership, which is also known as GM, uh, GBMP, to improve care. And the first stop was to send these two lean leaders to a dynamite factory. And at first they were also going, wait, what are we doing in Connecticut, a dynamite factory? But that's where they got their training and they really saw that it applied. And that's what I love about Lean Six Sigma, that it doesn't matter what process you deal with it's the same method of trying to understand it see where the waste is and trying to improve it so this manufacturing based lean six sigma firm helped this this hospital and the results were over 1.8 million in savings they reduced laboratory blood uh, specimen turnaround time they reduced iv pump shortages i've seen that at a lot of healthcare facilities they had a positive impact on patients and their coworkers, and there's now a waiting list for Lean Six Sigma training throughout the hospital system, which is great. And just the report is the sense of pride around this is huge. And what's interesting is GBMP is also sponsoring the Lean Northeast Conference this October, and their keynote speaker is Paul Akers, and he's our featured interview guest next month. <laughs> so... So this, this was, yeah, this was a huge circular story. Once I tried reading it, I said, wait a second, these guys are sponsoring Lean Northeast. So great story. Still not sure about Dynamite, but they had Dynamite results and that is awesome. Dynamite! <laughs> um, how about you, Tracy? Uh, what's going on uh, at Results Washington? So I'm glad you asked. And this is near and dear to my heart because I actually spent a lot of time in Washington helping some of the agencies up there with Lean and Six Sigma process improvement. But ultimately, I have to say congratulations to all of Washington State, especially Results Washington, because they are featured in the Harvard Kennedy School article. And in 2016, the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation received funding to launch a project called Operational Excellence in Government. And and Washington State is the key area that they're focusing on. The The goal of this project was to identify operational efficiency success across state and local government and to celebrate and publicize those successes via this website. Now, this site that is listed in the Harvard Kennedy School, makes available for the first time 30 existing studies of government efficiency, but they really are highlighting Washington State, and I'm very proud of it, and I just want to say congratulations to all of them. They are doing really well. They're, I would say they're a trailblazer for all of the states in Washington. Results Washington is the arm that was created in 2013 by Governor Jay Inslee, And they are really 
focused on driving operational efficiency and process improvement in government. So they have five top statewide goals and the government leaders have been challenged to track their progress against these goals and to apply lean into improving their processes. So here's just a couple of examples of some of the successes that they've had. Besides saving 1 million hours in lobby wait times, they have also had 1 million hours of time saved in Department of Licensing using process improvement and partnering with private driver training schools. They've had a 15% decrease in speed-related deaths, 20% faster processing of DNA tests at crime labs, and reducing that backlog by 10%, and cutting staff overtime by 56% because they streamlined the process. They've saved 6.2 million in recovered overpayments from the Department of Labor and Industries, a 28% increase in one year, and 2.3 million in savings a year on long distance phone calls. Wow, that Mm. is a lot of taxpayer dollars saved, which is amazing. And guess what? They are also very much promoting what they're doing in Washington. Next month in October, they're having a Lean Washington conference. I believe it's their fifth year that they've had this conference. They sell out every year, oh, because it's free. But 3,000 people come to this, this, this conference. And I would encourage you to go if you're anywhere close to the Tacoma Convention Center in October on the, I believe it's the 17th and 18th of next month. And if you do come, come see Tracy and me. We'll be there. (laughs) That's right. We're presenting. Hello. And you can meet us. And we get to meet you. Uh, That's a great story. I'm particularly excited about Harvard making this available and championing these government efforts. That is a fabulous development. I'm going to keep an eye on that. You're listening to the Just in Time Cafe podcast. I'm Elizabeth Swan. Up next, it's the printed page. So, Elizabeth, what is so good about stress? <laughs> That's a good question, Tracy. This is one of those paradigm shifting books. You can't think about stress the same way after you read it or after you watch her TED Talk. So this month's book is The Upside of Stress, Why Stress is Good for You and How to Get Good at It by health psychologist Kelly McGonigal. And her basic premise is, if you think stress will kill you, it probably will. But but if you don't, you know, you get better health, you get problem solving skills, you have peak performance, motivation, confidence, resilience, all kinds of fabulous things happen. So the book is a bit... In my mind, it's a bit of a mea culpa from her because she used to run workshops on how to avoid stress, right? She was all about how to manage your time better, how to get better sleep, how to, you know, all these things that you think, oh man, I wish I could do that, but I don't have time. I'm too stressed out. (laughs) So what she realized was she's fostering the wrong attitude. Just the act of avoiding stress can hurt you, you know, just physically and environmentally. So she cites many, many studies but it actually makes sense once you start listening to what happens to folks. So one of the examples was a high school football team. Their view of their pregame, their pregame stress was that they were amped up and they were excited, right? So these are, they're taking this pregame, what I'd say jitters and just going, wow, you know, let's, let's get amped. Let's get excited about this game. But when they were asked about their pre-exam stress, they called it uh, nerves. We got anxiety, We're going to choke under pressure. So they're getting the same shot of adrenaline throughout their bodies, but they're they're enabling different uh, views of both these situations. So they could still use that super energy and that super focus to apply to both the game and the exams. And that's what we get. We get these, it sounds like almost like a um, natural doping. You get all these amazing (laughs) dopamine and adrenaline and oxytocin and all these things that are that are there for you. And the trick is to recognize your own reaction to stress. And you get to decide. If you start seeing that you're going into fight or flight mode, that's one kind of one of the most publicized stress response, you could start to change that into, well, how do I address this challenge? You know, so can I use those endorphins to to meet the challenge? That's your secret weapon. Having these 
you know, incredible cocktail of chemicals coursing through you, you can use those. There's also a great piece she has on another stress response, which is called tending and befriending. And this really comes to mind right now because it's a response to being afraid or being lonely. And if you reach out to others and help them, it helps you. It's a calming, uh, it increases your resilience, increases your confidence. And just think about just watching the news over the past few weeks, watch, watching people with their boat trailers just go straight into Houston to help folks, uh, victims of Harvey, or just watching the money pouring in, uh, or people going to Florida to help people rebuild, get clear roads of with chainsaws. It's incredible, but that is that tend and befriend response uh, it, it will help you with your own fear uh, and your and your own stress. So I don't know about you, Tracy, but I got so much out of this book. I got a lot out of it too. And I really like the tend and befriend approach as well. So I, I, I totally agree. And I loved her introduction in this book and how she spent all this time telling people how stress was bad for them and you shouldn't you shouldn't deal with that. You need to deal better with stress. And she actually discovered that the way she was doing it was making people stressed out. <laughs> right. And I really like this book because it does, it does help with a lot of strategies and it does talk about how, how you can make stress good for you. And if you actually believe that and that your belief systems and reinforce that, that there's a lot of things you can do. The, 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 um, what you mentioned about tend and befriend, you know, I, I read something in this book about the Boston marathoner, Natalie, who was a 32 year old physician who finished the marathon on a broken foot. And then the bombing happened and she ran to help people and she treated five people and four of them survived. And she said that was her way of dealing with the stress. It, 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 she performed in, in a very stressful situation by helping others Um, so what I really like about the book is there was a lot of studies and a lot of research backing the hypotheses that our views of stress and how we handle it changes how it affects us body, mind, and soul. There were Mm -hmm. a lot of tests done that measured responses, stress response by taking a saliva test. And what was really interesting is there was one study in there that basically said that if you have a higher stress response initially, you actually handle stress better in the long run and are less likely to have post-traumatic stress disorder if that occurred, which was shocking to me. So there's just really interesting snippets like that of studies that were done and they have measurable responses. So, you know, based on what was in your saliva. So my favorite, my favorite um, takeaway from this book is stress is harmful except when it's not. And and she writes, stress increases the risk of health problems, except when people regularly give back to their communities. Stress Mm. increases the risk of dying, except when people have a sense of purpose. Stress increases the risk of depression, except when people see a benefit in their struggles. It just, just goes to speaking about how we're handling the stress And it's not stressful if it's done in this way. If you believe that it's stressful, it is, just as you said. And she wrote at the end, writing a book is stressful. (laughs) And I mean that in a good way. So I really, I really liked this book a lot. I have over the years, a lot of people, I I have been told that I handle stress very well. You know, a lot of people say I run it at like 120 (laughs) um, all the time. And people always ask me, how do you do it? I, I don't know. That's just how I'm wired. I just, I embrace it. And so I I read this book with my head nodding a lot, like, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. And people tell me I handle stress very well. So it was a a great validator for me that I'm doing something right. And that there's, for the things that really do stress me out, there are strategies that, that are available in this book that I didn't even really think about. But when you, when you actually speak about it, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. And people do that. And it does make me feel better. So I would highly encourage this book to everyone. Everyone should read this book because most people are stressed out. <laughs> they, need, they need better ways to handle it. Hear, hear. So you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. I'm Tracy O'Rourke. And in just a short while, we're going to hear about my interview with Ashley Gambier. But up first, a question from our question and answer one of our subscribers had. (music) 
Tracy, here's a question for you from one of our learners. Do you have a scorecard that shows ROI, otherwise known as return on investment? That is a great question. And I agree, a scorecard would be an important element to build. However, that is one of the last steps, I believe, in creating a strategic plan for Lean Six Sigma. So we talk about this whole process in a webinar called Strategic Planning for a Lean Six Sigma Program Office. And we have a four-part blog series on our website. Both of those are both on our website that talk about this. And I really feel like in a nutshell, you first have to develop a vision, mission, goals, and then measures. And from that work, you can develop a scorecard. So what you measure on your scorecard really does depend on your goals, your vision, and hopefully those things are connected to the strategic objectives of your organization. So the short answer is no, we don't have one because we find that the measures on a scorecard vary greatly and you really need to do your due diligence about what you want to measure. We have some examples of scorecards and dashboards that people have developed in our webinars and the blogs that I mentioned earlier. So I check out those examples and there's a brief how to on how to put one together. But it's ultimately what are you trying to measure in terms of success? Great answer. Thank you, Tracy. Coming up next, this month's coupon code, so stay tuned. Up next, it's today's special, which is Tracy's interview with Ashley Gambier. Tracy, can you give us a little taste of what your upcoming interview is all about? Yes. So Ashley Gambier is the Senior Director for Strategic Initiatives for Operational Strategic Initiatives at UC San Diego. I'll be speaking with her today, and I'm really excited because she right now is basically putting the infrastructure together for UC Health Systems and the Process Improvement Program that's happening there. So I'm really excited to talk with her. That sounds like a great one. I'm all ears. Okay, everyone, it's time to announce the dun -dun 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 coupon code. This coupon is for 30% off any of our Lean Six Sigma training and certification courses. That's white belt, yellow belt, green belt, black belt, or lean training. So that's pretty good. What's the occasion? We're celebrating fall and we're celebrating our listeners because we're grateful to have you all as an audience. We want to offer you a perk for joining us at the Just In Time Cafe. So... Just use coupon code MOCHA30. So like the coffee, that's M-O-C-H-A-3-0. Use that during checkout. Make sure to use it soon. The coupon code will expire at the end of October. And that takes us into today's special. Thanks, everybody. You're listening to the Just In Time Cafe. I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and joining me today is Ashley Gambier. How are you today, Ashley? I'm good. Thank you for having me today, Tracy. Good. I'm, I hope you're enjoying your coffee in the, in the Just In Time Cafe. Delicious. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Ashley and UCSD before we talk with her. So Ashley has worked at UC San Diego since 2006. She is a results-driven professional with experience driving strategy and building operational excellence which makes her perfect for this position. Ashley is a certified project manager, certified change practitioner, and a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt through UCSD Extension's Lean Six Sigma Black Belt program. She earned an MBA from the Rady School of Management at UCSD and has a BS in mathematics from the University of Puget Sound, and that's in the Seattle area, Washington, right? That's right. And did you live there for a while? I lived there for four years, and I loved it. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. What's really exciting about getting a chance to talk with you today about Ashley is that UCSD was recently ranked the 15th best university in the world by the 2017 Academic Ranking of World Universities and also named the f world's fourth best public college. That is really exciting. How do employees feel about that? We're so proud and so excited. We, we, uh, we're a young university. We've only been around about 50 years and uh, to have achieved this level of success, and we see that we see it as a challenge to keep pushing ourselves to do better, and also as as a real honor to be able to serve the education mission in this way. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So I, I just have a couple of questions for you um, because 
you guys, UCSD, not only offer Lean Six Sigma training to students, but you're actually undergoing an initiative to implement it in, within the UCSD program itself. And so I'd really love to hear how that is going in your organization. Um, this is sort of about talking about how Lean Six Sigma might be transforming education, and we'd love to hear a little bit about what you guys are doing at UCSD as a part of that. So why Lean Six Sigma for UCSD and why now? I think that it's the perfect time. And in, in fact, I could say we, we should have always been doing it. But the shift in, um, in, the, in the process improvement field uh, to apply it to services, I, there's been a lot more uh, momentum on the healthcare side and also in government to look at how we do our work. We serve a public mission, so we want to be very efficient in how we deliver value to the people we serve. And you know, a lot of what we look at with innovation, sometimes we focus too much on the transformational innovations, and we end up just causing a lot more um, layers on top of the existing work that's happening. So combining that that broad transformational initiative based improvement in our operations to combine that with this empowerment uh, everybody understands how what they do in serving the people they serve can be improved with a common set of tools and a common language allows for those incremental changes that really add up to have the biggest bang for the buck mm -hmm. nice is the lean six sigma effort working would you say I would say it is. You know, we aren't the only group on campus that uses this methodology. Um, we're certainly big advocates. Uh, we are, I'd say, at the early stage of the cultural shift that comes. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, if you showed up, you wouldn't walk around the campus and see Kanbans everywhere. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say that we are at a point where you'd say we're, we're mature in the Lean Six Sigma implementation. But uh, where we are is... We've, we've had a few years of actively promoting it, actively um, creating awareness, having some incredible quick wins, uh, moving from having it be really run centrally with a few, few black belts out there trying to make changes to really broadening the base. Uh, we've trained over 800 people this year alone on the uh, yellow belt champion level and um, that's just led to so much momentum, kind of grassroots, as well as from leadership when they see their teams come back with this aha moment of, you know, starting with empathy, understanding what value is to the people they're serving, and then thinking differently about how they deliver that value. Um, so I'd say we're just getting started, but so far it's been really well received and we're already feeling the benefit. I'm, I'm really excited just to see where we go with it over time. Me too, because you are gaining a lot of traction in just the short time that you've been doing this. What kind of results have you guys seen from some of the improvements? Well, it's, I, I'd say positive, um, and probably in the typical categories of, you know, some cost savings or new revenue generation, um, as well as quality, you know, and it, getting rid of the rework and the things that keep us from focusing on what we want to be focusing on. On top of that, I'd say that we've seen a, a small shift, but measurable in um, kind of employee engagement. And um, I think that comes with this methodology being really, I always refer to it as a tool of empowerment because um, with, with some common tools, um, you're, you're giving people the opportunity to look at a problem differently and a different way to communicate upward about how to make changes that, that would have a difference. Okay. So is there anything you would have done differently yet, or so far, I should say, with the implementation or the rollout or anything like that? Probably the only thing I would do differently is I might find a way to deliver the champion level training to a broader group earlier on. We just started doing that this year, really, and the impact has been tremendous. And I don't think we needed to wait this long to do that. I think we could have probably done that sooner and had a broader impact sooner. 
because it, it was a big cultural shift for us. And so um, just increasing awareness has really um, had a profound impact and, and really accelerated mm -hmm. our implementation. So I think we could have done that sooner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, has some of the excitement from leaders also been because they've seen some of the results and some of the excitement from the people that have gone through the program? It has. So I think there was probably some initial concern that this was a manufacturing tool. And, um, you know, honestly, in academia, we don't see ourselves as a big business. Uh, we really see ourselves as a public service. And so implementing kind of corporate techniques and, um, you know, I, I can't say we were super open-minded to it as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of what we had to do was change the language. Uh, we didn't call things Kaizen events. We called them solution sessions. You know, we, we kind of made it, um, we adapted the tools and terminology to what would be comfortable in our environment. And so doing it that way, um, I think, kind of helped us over some of those initial perception hurdles and then allowed us to deliver some results. Um, you know, we've had projects, single projects resulting in a million dollar impact, you know, and that that's pretty eye-opening to leadership. That and really so, gets their attention. Yeah, so combining kind of this grassroots enthusiasm, some results, and then making sure that we are doing it our own way and not just forcing someone else's model as a layer on top of our operating model, really trying to ingrain it into how we do business. Um, I think, um, you know, kind of a lean principle is uh, steal shamelessly and make it your own. And, and so we, right. we, we've really tried to do that so that it's successful. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. That's important. Making it something your own that you know is going to work culturally. I think people don't think about that enough sometimes, and there's a failure piece there where they're not as successful because they're sort of trying to just drop it into the culture, and that doesn't necessarily work. So it's great to hear that you're – there's an element of not reinventing everything, but there is an element of making it your own, right? Yeah. So do you have any advice for any other educational institutions that might be implementing Lean Six Sigma within their organization? Probably not too much advice. We'd actually probably benefit from receiving some from others who've been doing this longer, but the advice that I would offer out there is to always consider the context in which you're making a change. Your cultural starting point is going to impact how quickly you can implement something like Lean Six Sigma, and just being aware of that um, and and you know, as we talked about a moment ago, thinking about how can you create your own best practice by leveraging this existing one. And um, I'd also say not to overdo it at first. Pick a few tools that you can put in everyone's arsenal to create a common language and have some quick impact and not try and boil the ocean uh, at the very beginning because it could be overwhelming. And then always, always focus on who you're serving. Good. So... What is next for the OSI group and, and the group in particular that's supporting Lean Six Sigma at UCSD? We are a small team and there are some other small teams that have green and black belts on their teams that are, are making big differences. Um, but I think our real impact is going to be through the broadening of this and the, the shared ownership across the board as opposed to just specific initiatives the mindset shift that comes with that training and exposure. So building capacity is probably the biggest thing. There's a few key areas that we're um, actively working to um, bring those groups into Lean Six Sigma as a core component of their operating model. So in ITS and in information technology services, the CIO has uh, worked in environments that have used this methodology as a strong advocate. And um, so his team's working very hard to build this into their standard operating model, um, working with the health system, focusing a lot more on Lean than Six Sigma to figure out how we can embed this in our operations for the outpatient ambulatory care. And um, we're also working across the UC system for all the campuses to see how we might be able to um, kind of share this this with the other uh, campuses in our system. Right. So, wow, that's that's a lot. You're doing all different businesses at UCSD, if you will, or what would you call those departments, or what, what do you call them at UCSD? Just 
areas, areas groups, groups, like health, functions. health services. They're, they're very different functions. Yes. Yeah. And I love that because it shows that people, you can really apply this to any type of work or industry that is happening out in the world. So I love that. So tell me a little bit more about the scholarship program because that might be a best practice. So you had mentioned that you're giving scholarships to UCSD employees to go through the Lean Six Sigma Green Belt and Black Belt at the extension. Mm -hmm. so tell us more so, about that. So what, what we were doing originally is our team was serving as mentors and coaches, uh, helping other people on our campus get their green belts. And um, we still offer mentorship and coaching, but initial training we realized it really isn't the core service that we offer. And it was taking a lot of our resources and it also required us to have some budget for external consulting for that sensei level guidance. And so uh, we thought, you know, let's take that budget that we're spending on that external consulting and give it as scholarships. Um, we, we didn't need to create a redundant training, UC San Diego Extension. We reached out to them to learn more about their training. And, and I think there was a perception that it wouldn't work for services. And when we talked to the instructors, we were blown away at their breadth of experience and how they were able to translate these tools into any field. And uh, we, we sent our own team through the training to see what it was like and make sure that we would feel confident sending, you know, hopefully over time, hundreds of people to their um, training. And um, we were so impressed. The, um, the quality was incredible. The instructor's ability to use examples and apply the principles to many industries was outstanding. And honestly, being in the classroom with other people who work in different industries, sharing their examples and uh, the dialogue, you know, learning from other industries is one of the um, core uh, components of effective creativity, right? So mm -hmm. we can really learn from each other and um, We've been completely satisfied and, and plan to continue partnering with them through the scholarships as long as we can. Well, it sounds to me like those scholarship opportunities are growing, too. You're getting a little, some more support, I hear. We've had a lot of support um, from leadership the last couple of years and uh, hope that that, I expect that that will continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience that I didn't ask you about UCSD, what you're doing as a part of the Lean Six Sigma program or anything that you think would be valuable? I would just say if you're out there and either new to this methodology or a veteran of this, um, you know, keep, keep pushing for it. I think that sometimes um, you can feel like an island out there and you see how this could have an impact, but it's hard to kind of get other people on board because we all get so busy. I think especially right now, our world moves at such a fast pace that it's hard to stop and take the time to measure and take the time to pull people together to come up with solutions. And then you create that action plan and it gets buried beneath your email list. You know, it, it, it's hard to create the space to do this. So I would just say, you know, keep at it. It works. I think if, if you can, Probably the best way to gain traction is to just keep doing it mm -hmm. because it proves itself every time. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming to have some coffee with me at the Just In Time Cafe. And I want to thank our listeners also for joining us as well. Don't forget to go to LeanSixSigma.com's podcast to share your feedback or listen to more podcasts also available to download in iTunes. So we will see you next time. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for joining us for Just In Time Cafe. Visit GoLeanSixSigma.com slash podcast to share your feedback or listen to more podcasts. Also, please subscribe to Just In Time Cafe on iTunes.